Shabbat Shalom. Welcome. It's good that we can be together. And thanks for joining us online. I hope that you are not only listening, but that you are also worshipping with us and praying with us and joining us in reading the Bible. And that you are totally participating in this way with us in this worship service. That's even true for those who will be watching um, the recording afterwards. Although it's better in the live stream. <laughs> And I thank, especially thank those who react to the things that I say. And the few people that are here in the room. They sometimes come up to me and ask a question after the sermon. And sometimes they are not okay with some things and they will start some discussions with me and I'm, I'm glad for that. Because that shows me at least that they weren't sleeping. And if you're watching us uh, online and you are not okay with something and you write that down and you want to discuss something Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Because you are watching uh, with attention and you are listening attentively. What else could somebody who is preaching wish for? Well, simply that the listeners won't sleep. Thank you for that. Even more important is that you think also. That you don't simply accept things, well, that's sad and that's how it is. But that you think about it, you reflect about things. And it's good that you have questions and reflect things and that you maybe are not okay with something, you have a different opinion on something. Because that means that you're not simply passive listeners. But you are active participants of our Beit Midrash, of our um, looking at the scriptures. So praise the Lord for that. And you have something you are able to rejoice about. Last uh, Saturday, I was partly speaking about Shabbat, but not only. The Shabbat is a very uh, delicate uh, theme, very a bit complicated. It's um, it's a subject where theologies go apart. The subject of the Shabbat. Um, is linked to Jews and non-Jews yeah, in the body of the Messiah. In the times of uh, Moshe and uh, the so-called Old Testament, nobody had any questions about the Shabbat. The Jews knew that it was uh, something that characterizes themselves and it was something very important for the Jews. The 
the day was a sign of um, of um, the relation they had with God and it was something especially and only exclusively Jewish, something that determined the Jews. And the other people, they also knew that the Shabbat was something special that separated the Jews. Well, at those times, the Jews said, the Shabbat is for us. And other people would say that is the people of the Shabbat. And if they wanted the Jews to be like all the other people and um, yeah, to mingle with them, they uh, kept them from keeping the Shabbat. So, be like us. So it was a very clear understanding of the Shabbat for the Jews as well as for the non-Jews. It was a special day that God gave to his um, chosen people. It was very clear and understandable. If you want to be with the chosen people of God, well, go to, to them, join them, you can do a lot of things. Um, yeah, you can do a lot of things, but you're not obligated to do them. So you're welcome uh, to join in to the Shabbat, but you don't have to. Because this has exclusively been given to the Jews. And with the coming of Yeshua, uh, many things have changed. Because the Jews and non-Jews now have the possibility to be together with one God in Yeshua. In Yeshua, other people have found the access to God, um, who is called the God of Israel. And then some uh, problems started arising. In the beginning, uh, the assembly of those believing in Yeshua was mainly Jewish. Afterwards, after other people um, came to faith, they joined the Jews and everything was Jewish. So who were their teachers? It was the apostles. So they were Jews. They didn't have any other teachers. Maybe they even spoke with a Jewish accent, probably. <laughs> Because there was nothing else, no other image, and no other covenant, and no other Bible. There only was the Tanakh, the Old Testament. But as time passed, more and more people from other uh, nationalities, other people joined. And there rose slowly uh, an envy. Wait. The whole Bible speaks about Jews. Everything is for Jews. And the whole Torah is for the Jews. Well, today we read from uh, our weekly chapter. And it says everywhere, tell the people of Israel. 
Where are all the non-Jews in there? Well, the non-Jew might be somewhere among there, but God didn't even uh, bother to, to mention him. We remember that it speaks about um, the foreigner, those who left Egypt with the people of Israel. Imagine they are all standing together, the Jews and the other people who came with them, and God only speaks to the Jews. Imagine the other people standing there, but God doesn't speak to them directly, only in the third person. It's a bit like my grandparents, my grandma and grandpa, they spoke to one another and spoke about me in the third person. Oh, he doesn't want to eat. <laughs> And I'm sitting at the same table. And they start speaking about me to one another, just as if I wasn't even there. Where did the get uh, do the Jews get that from? Well, look at history. <laughs> look at how God spoke to the Jews, saying you. And the other people who were with the Jews at the same time, he only spoke about them. So you, if he is with you, and he wants to do this, then tell him, and he will do like you tell him. Just of is if those other people weren't even there. And when I read the Torah, I place myself in the place of, for example, the Egyptian who was there. I, I, I get nostalgic and remember my grandmas and grandpas talking about me in the third person. At the end of the first century of our time, or the second century, when many people had already found access to the God of Israel. And all those people or nations uh, see that everything said about them is said in the third form. But he addresses the people of Israel in the second person, you. I go, uh, what is that? How is that possible? Am I like a second choice? Am I not just as good as they are? And because of that, uh, that envy, um, there starts a of theology of replacement um, where the church becomes the new Israel so the believers in Yeshua become the new Israel and this old Israel they didn't believe in Yeshua and Jesus so God put them aside And now I can read the Bible in a totally different way. 
speak to the sons of Israel, if it says like that in one place. Uh, so who does that speak to now? Well, it speaks to me, because I am Israel now. So that which is uh, said to Israel, it, it, it is said to me now totally as well. Except for the, um, the curses. I haven't seen any church reading Deuteronomy chapter 20. Uh, chapter 28 and saying all oh, all those curses they all go towards me no 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 all the bad things that God said about Israel that's what they said about that Israel but the new Israel he only says good things about them so this way when God speaks he speaks to me So what I'm doing now, or what I've just been doing, is thinking about it like the Christians in the second century did. And many following generations in the next 2,000 years. When God says, speak to the sons of Israel, this um, speaks to me. But what should I be doing now? What about the food and the festivities? What about the donkeys or the cattle if they kill somebody? It's a very interesting subject. And we will be speaking about it more. But I want to show you a view today. Read the Ten Commandments. And it says, speak to the sons of Israel. Shabbat. Keep the Shabbat. And you think that this speaks to you. This is meant for you, even though you are not a Jew. Well, then you're reading this because you have been raised like that um, from by your parents and they've been raised like that by their parents. Uh, almost for 2,000 years you have been taught that the Israel of the Old Testament is you now. And if this is not totally uh, actual anymore, not well, yeah, even though this is not really up to date anymore, people still try um, interpreting everything that is speaking about Israel for themselves. So please, please be very careful with that, please. Please don't take from the Jews what God has given to them. Please leave us the circumcision and the Shabbat at least. And also other things, of course. We haven't had um, land for a long time, the country. 
and there has been, and there still is anti-Semitism everywhere. And life as a Jew is not simple. Even if you might think that all of us are rich, <laughs> you're wrong. <laughs> the life of a Jew is a difficult life. And throughout the whole Jewish history and our life, we have those circumcisions, the Shabbat, and um, all those festivities. We, we kept them and we carried them through as something that is very um, costly to us because God has given it to us. Please don't take it away from us and uh, don't uh, don't ask to have it for yourself please don't take our Torah as if it was yours please forgive me if I say that in a very uh, hard way please don't be um, offended I want to underline again, if you want to do this, you are really welcome. Please be with us. But don't take it away from the Jews and carry it to your place. If you want this, come towards us and be with the Jews and love them. If you don't love the Jews, then leave the Shabbat alone. And if you want Shabbat, then uh, pray that you will learn to love the Jews, because without Israel, the Shabbat doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. You may have a different opinion on this. And you can write me emails or comments or put a thumbs down. <laughs> you can do whatever you want. You can come and visit us. We can discuss a bit. I don't like writing that much. I, I prefer speaking personally, but let's do that. Let's speak about it. Please feel welcome to be together with us. Especially if we think about that Yeshua has destroyed this wall and this separation between us. Um, all those who have been here uh, know that we are um, rejoicing about guests and we don't have a first or second choice. The Jews in our church, they complain that they um, get less attention than the other people. <laughs> we love every uh, nation, the, uh, and the Jews and the non-Jews, because God loves all people, and Yeshua loves all people. And in his side, all humans are very uh, special and valuable. We are not the first and not the last ones who don't know what to do with the Tanakh. In 1 Corinthians 10, the Apostle Paul writes to um, other nations. And I'll be reading from verse 1 to 6.
и Мафии из духовного последующего камня, камень же он, Машех Мессия. Но для многих из них благод... благоволил Бог, ибо они поражены были в пустыне. А это были образы для нас, чтобы мы не были покатимы на злое, как они были покатимы. First Corinthians 10, 1-6 Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses, in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, since they were struck down in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us, so that we will not desire evil things as they did. That which we read in the Torah The Apostle Paul takes it here and, and describes it as uh, like an example, like a prototype for us so that we can learn something. Verse 6 says that that which had happened um, was set as an example for us. So God did this uh, on purpose. Read the Torah. Even if you are a non-Jew, read the Torah and the Tanakh. Because God allowed these things to happen uh, on purpose, as an example. So the Shabbat and everything related to it um, it's not an obligation for other people um, but it has a, a sense to itself and it's it's like an example or a prototype. And those things that we saw in this weekly reading of somebody is uh, kicked or uh, killed by an, uh, all of those animals that we read about, um, how you should behave with that. This is not a commandment for you, if you are not to, but uh, it has an idea to itself and then it's something like a prototype for you because God did it. And the stories really read in the Torah. They have a sense for our life. So that we should know how to act. Do you want an example for that with the Shabbat? As I said last Saturday, um, the Shabbat as a day has been given to the people of Israel, but the sins that lies in it. One of the reasons uh, placed in it is that uh, just as God worked on six days and on the seventh he rested, you should do that as well. So take a day off. and enter into rest. That's one of the principles. The principle I see clearly in that is don't work seven days a week. Yeah, even God gave us an example. <laughs> He wasn't tired, but 
but he did that on purpose as a prototype for us. Take a rest. So if you want to rest on Shabbat with the Jews, well, great, I, I rejoice. Do that, take your rest on Shabbat with the Jews. And you can worship with us. Thanks for joining us today online on Shabbat. And I want to uh, underline that again. You're really very welcome. Whether God speaks to you in the second or the third person, there's something in it that you can learn. And in Yeshua, God speaks to everyone in the second person as you. No matter which people you belong to. I am so glad that Yeshua is not like my grandparents. <laughs> he doesn't speak about other people in the third person. Yeshua is also a Jew, but he is different. He turns personally to everyone. And that's a great joy in that, in being together with Yeshua. In Leviticus 19, verse 2, we read, Verse 1 and 2, Leviticus 19. The Lord spoke to Moses, speak to the entire Israelite community and tell them, be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Who is God, God turning towards here? Whom should Moses um, tell that? To the children of Israel. So, who was a holy people? The people of Israel. I'm sorry. Were other people worse? No. But that's simply how it is. That's what God um, did and how it was. And let's look at what happened in Yeshua. Back then there was only Israel and only the Jews were able to be a uh, holy people. But in Yeshua, the blessing of the holiness also came to all the other people. Let's turn to First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians, Chapter Four, Verse Three. This is only one example. For well, this is God's will, your sanctification, that you keep away from sexual immorality. And this has been written to non-Jews. Sanctification. Be holy, as I am holy. This is said to all the people in Yeshua. And I think that is great. 
back then God wanted the Jews to be holy. Now everyone can be holy. That's amazing. And in this context, it says in verse 2, For you know what commands we gave you through the Lord Jesus. There are some uh, commands in Yeshua that are for all believers, and, but they don't contradict the spirit of the Torah, but they have been given to everyone. And we are reading here about uh, keeping away from sexual immorality in verse 4. Everyone should keep to holiness and um, not follow with lustful passions. Verse 6 that you should um, act towards your brother following the law, that you shouldn't seek your own interest but um, do the best for the other person. Verse 7, for God has not called us to impurity, but to live in holiness. Verse 9, you don't need me to write you about the love, the brotherly love, because you've been taught by God, and so on. So, sanctification is for everyone. God wants everyone to be holy. And I want to be talking about that more in the future. There are three uh, levels of holiness in the Bible, or uh, three aspects of holiness. The first holiness is um, the holiness of position. You have been placed somewhere. Um, the other holiness is in your way of life. And that's the um, complete holiness. Oh, the third one. Stop thinking about those three categories. What happens when we come to Yeshua? He forgives our sins. He gives us life. And many places in the Bible say that we are holy in Him. He has already sanctified us. You are holy for God already. <laughs> because uh, your position where you are on the GPS, uh, it is already in heaven. You already have holiness. Holiness that um, doesn't depend on how you lived and what you did. And it, it's not depending on how good you are, because God forgave you. And He made you a new creation. That's the first aspect of holiness. The second one, the second aspect is that the Bible tells us that we also should live, according to this, in holiness. 
we act in the way that God expects of us. We need to present ourselves to God. I know uh, we need to, to, to give ourselves away to God. So that He can work in us and through us and that our life changes. So that we should be uh, like God in our everyday life. And the third aspect of holiness is in the future, when Yeshua returns to us, and when we get a new body. And when we leave behind everything that um, that is difficult here now, and if we become um, complete and just as holy as He is. Those are the three aspects of holiness, and all those three are in our life. Do you remember that which happened to Israel was a prototype for us? We see those three aspects of holiness in the Torah. The first one, God made Israel a holy people. Even before they got the Torah, what did God do with Israel? He led Israel out of Egypt. And he told them, you will be my kingly priests. You will be my people. My people. Let go. So that they can serve me. That's how Israel left Egypt. Not because Israel was deeply um, believing. And not because Israel was that holy in their way of life or because they were better than other people, because God said so. And that, it's the same with you and me in Yeshua. God decided it, and He made us holy. Holy Vladimir, holy Katya. Doesn't that sound nice? <laughs> holy Vladimir. Holy Sveta. <laughs> like they say in, in, in German, Holy Max Mustermann. <laughs> he made us holy. That's the first thing. When Israel came out of Egypt, they were given the Torah, the laws. And they were told um, to act according to it. And if you act according to this, you will be truly holy. Not just um, after the law, because um, God did it for you. No, but, uh, but because your way of life. Um, is like the character of God. So the next step then, you will enter into the Holy Land and you will enjoy life there. Doesn't it sound like that in the Torah? Led out, out of Egypt, becoming a special people. That's the first one. Then for a special way of life, to find um, complete peace and holiness and enjoy that in the um, Promised Land. So a large part of the Torah, what does it speak about? Um, leaving Egypt or entering the Holy uh, Land? No, it speaks about um, the time in between. <laughs> 
and that time is uh, the sanctification. Yeah, it's the uh, yeah the applying of holiness, the holiness of God in our lives, and that's what we will be speaking more about. And how can we be holy in our everyday life? Please continue joining our services. And for today, let's remember. Because Yeshua died for our sins. And he rose again from the dead. And he went up to heaven and sent his Holy Spirit to us. We have gained the new birth from on high, which is related to the forgiveness of sins. So, um, before the law, our names are written into the book of life, and God calls us holy. And Yeshua will return at his time and we will be made completely holy in everything, even in our everyday lives. And we will um, inherit the kingdom of God. So this first and the last is guaranteed to us in Yeshua. Hallelujah. And what is important for us now is this part in the middle. Our life here now, our um, real life here in the desert. We are right now in the desert and God is working in us and we are learning. And that's what we were speaking about more. So may God bless you. Shalom.